you know, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who works at Salesforce, which I don't know if I've told you this, this is really cool. I and I was so. like, you know, th- my hold code dreams. And I'm like, how do, you know, how do you do that? And he, he was a pretty, like, he was one of, I think, 30 GMs at Salesforce. And so at that time, at least Salesforce was organized into five big divisions and then had like six divisions under each five. So there's 30 mm-hmm. sort of like PL owner GMs. He was one of them. And I was like, how does Mark Benioff run that business? Like, I don't get it. How does somebody run a business of that scale? And he goes, dude, it's super simple. He goes, everybody submits a plan. And typically that plan has to grow a minimum of 20% because that's just like Mark Benioff's thing. We grow 20% every year. And if you're hitting the plan, you meet with him once a quarter. And if you're missing the plan, you meet with him once a week. <laughs> wow. And I was like, does he yell? I love how simple scream? that is. What's up, everyone? I'm Alex Lieberman. Yo, this is Jesse Puji. And this is The Crazy Ones. What's up, everybody? It's Jesse Puji here from The Crazy Ones with my co-host, Alex Lieberman. What's I've up, guys? I've never done that before. That's the first time I've ever kicked Sounded this great. Off. Honestly, I think you Thank should you. take it over. We are jumping in with another hit record and see what happens episode here. Uh, this is another format we're playing around with and experimenting on. We just called it Jesse style. Uh, <laughs> and so give us feedback on it. We'll continue to play around with different structures, founders journal structures, uh, and have a blast with it. So, dude, what's going on with you? Um... I can't remember if I talked about it last episode, but uh, I've been traveling a lot, uh, which I may have mentioned. This is, I've now traveled to five places in the last six weeks. Uh, My travel is about to finish. Um, I'm going to Miami tomorrow for my best man at my wedding's bachelor party, but I'm very excited to be done with it because I hate the feeling of being out of routine, not having habit. I find it very hard to be productive when I'm traveling. Right. So that that's that, and then otherwise, just been pushing forward, plunging the plunge, yeah. Which it, it really is such an emotional roller coaster. And then I'm starting to test out this new content agency idea that I did a founders journal on um, a week or two ago. And so I'm happy to talk yeah, about one, either of those. One question: I have another third topic or question for you. You know, you, I've been doing my TikTok stuff. You've probably seen it. And I've been using some people to help me cut the clips of me talking usually in this office. And sometimes it's from our pod. You know, you spent a lot of time on TikTok. I remember kind of something similar talking into the mic and it was like kind of not going anywhere. And then 60 second startup happened. I remember you texting me about it going, Hey dude, I have a new idea. Like, I think I want to do this. What do you, and I remember the first one you're like holding a microphone <laughs> I think yeah, like, exactly. So, sometimes I feel like you don't give yourself enough credit for being an entrepreneur, especially a media entrepreneur. Like I was telling my wife when I was happening, I was like, man, this guy's just like a media genius. And she's like, what? And so talk about that journey. Like talk about the TikTok because so many people are like getting get, growing on social, growing the brand. I mean, it's sort of part of this digital agency concept you have. Yeah. But I'm curious more for your experience. And how did you how did you keep grinding? And then like, tell me about, you know, you, you picked a concept that worked and now you have, you went, I think you had a thousand TikTok followers and maybe 5,000 at most. And then all of a sudden you have like 300,000, right? Yeah. I mean, I've noticed this on every platform where I've created content, but there very much is kind of this power law of there are, let's call it 10% of your, whether it's tweets, whether it's your TikTok videos, whether it's your, your YouTube videos that contribute to 90% of your followers or subscribers. So if I look at Twitter, right? Like right now, I think I have 243,000 followers on Twitter. 210,000 of those followers came from three or four threads. And then on TikTok, I... Uh, I'd say it's a similar type of thing where of the 105 or 107,000 uh, followers I have on TikTok, I think 100,000 of them came from three or four videos. And by the way, the same thing just happened with Instagram. Instagram, nothing was happening. I had less than 10,000 followers. All of a sudden, one of my 60 second startup videos blew up and I'm at 55,000 followers on Instagram. Wow. All of that growth is within the last two weeks because of one video. One random 60 second startup that if you had asked me before, Alex, I have a lineup of all of your 60 second startup videos. Guess which one's going to go viral? That would never have been the one I picked. So I think part of the law there is- What was it? It was um, this uh, 
business called No Paleta. It's a like bath scrub, bath bomb uh, brand specifically made by four Latinos by a Latino founder. No Palera is a type of cactus in um, mm. Hispanic uh, culture. I believe it. it's in Mexico. And what was crazy is this video was posted and then there were thousands of people who reshared it on their stories. Like you can see on Instagram how many people share it um, and right. the numbers were crazy. So that's what got it going. And so then that also informed me, okay, every time I post a 60-second startup now, I need to make sure I hit up the founder who I just posted and ask them to basically have every employee of theirs, every family member, every ambassador right. do the same exact thing. But going back to 60 Second Startup, you know, honestly, the, where the idea came from is I was literally sitting on the toilet one day and I was like, I love Shark Tank, but there's no Shark Tank in a digital first environment. Why isn't there that? And then I basically said, this is a proven thing that works, which is entrepreneurs pitching their businesses, negotiating for a deal, getting feedback. Right. What does that look like in a short form social environment? And then at the time, it's still big, but at the time it was huge, like a man or woman on the street style videos of someone with a microphone interviewing someone else. And so I was like, why don't I just combine the two? And I think right. this is something that I've had to get over in my life is like, I think this is why I love being an early stage founder. It's why I love building things. I love the idea of being original. Right, I love the idea mm -hmm. of coming up with an idea and building my idea, my vision, and it's actually a very egotistical view, right? Because like so many of these things are like my idea of a content agency is not a novel thought. My idea of a backyard game is not a novel thought. Right. And so right. anyway, the reason I say that is because sixty second startup is simply a remix, and that's what oftentimes the best stuff is because you're not changing sure. people's behavior; you're just adapting existing behavior to a new environment. And and by right. the way, but I think one one thing I want to I want to talk about or highlight for this and is I think people oftentimes will like talk about TikTok and do these things and oh it's hit driven and even like your your thing I think is a little it can come across misleading to people um, because they think I have to come up with something that goes viral. That's kind of how people when they see oh totally. it goes viral so it and dude you re you recorded five hundred videos I actually show your TikTok to a lot of people who talk about this and I'm like this is, you know my my friend my co-host Alex. Like scroll all the way up, you know, like that's what I always tell them on your TikTok. I'm like, scroll all the way up. Like he's looking at the camera. He's kind of knows what he's talking about. He's making stuff up. He gets 300 views. And then he, you know, and and for me, it was, you know, one of the big ones was Bootstrap Giants on Twitter, right? That was the series. And again, yep. to your point, it came up. I, I, I came up with it out of nowhere. I go, you know, I love like when I get together with other founders, we love sharing stories of these companies that are like, dude, have you heard of this company? It does blah, blah, blah. And da, 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 da. and I was like, oh, let me write that one up. And then that like, I started a series of it. By the way, the other thing I'll throw out, and this will happen, I'm sure you've seen it too, is like now I post them and people aren't that interested in them anymore. It's kind of been played out, right? And I'm sure your 60-second totally. startup is going to have the same issue at some point. That That's the huge thing is these platforms move so quickly that even if you get a great concept, you have to change it after some period of time. So like if I look at my TikTok right now, my last three 60-second startups got 2,000 views, 1,000 views, and 3,800 views. And just for context, like my most watched 60-second startup had 600,000 or 700,000 views. Wow. And, and so again, like the, the, the issue with content is you just never know, is it not getting a lot of views because – it wasn't an interesting story that was told by the founder or is it because this is just now a tired format and you need to evolve it? And so I think one right. of the ways I think about it is how do I keep doing 60 second startup and find ways to up the stakes of it? So for example, I mean, I think I told you this, like one of the ways I'm trying to up the stakes is literally have founders pitch their businesses in absurd ways. So I have a guy who's set up to go skydiving <laughs> while pitching his business. But on the other hand, how do I try a format that's totally <laughs> different from that? That basically is right. almost like my R&D in the event. This is just a, a tired format and I do need to pivot it. And so for most of the content journey, you feel like you're in this like purgatory where you're just trying to figure things out. And I think my formula has always been continue to stick with it, continue to put, continue to put content out, be, have self-awareness and be really good at seeing signal of what's working. Because if you don't have self-awareness, you could create content for years and it still doesn't get better. And I right. think that's what when, – when you look at like 
any of these people like Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast is the is the he's not the best example because no very few people are ever gonna be of this size of Mr. Beast, but he's a good example in the sense of to your point, when you talked about me scrolling down or people scrolling down on my TikTok and looking at my first video, you do that for Mr. Beast and the contrast is even crazier. You go to his first right. video and it is worse than the videos that I create. And you look at what he does now and you know he did a $5 million production to put on the Squid Games remake. And so that's the thing. It's a combination of self-awareness with persistence. Yeah. And, and I think like, a couple other just quick thoughts. Everyone starts at nothing, essentially, or somewhere, right? Doesn't matter who you are. Uh, everyone looks at it, and I think when they see you, it looks effortless. But I was just doing the math while you were talking, and like, you probably have an hour of coordination for every single episode by some group of people. You probably have an hour of editing, and then yep. maybe say it takes you five minutes to ten minutes per call or something like that. And you said you've done five hundred. Yeah. That's a lot of content, right? And so it's funny because, again, on the side of the viewer, for me, even I know you and I, it looks effortless. I'm like, oh, these are so great. And, uh, you know, the same thing with the threads. And, and so I think it's just, a, you know, it's been in my mind because I've been doing it and it's kind of, it's fine, going fine. It's not going that great. But also I've been like I haven't been putting the time and mind, mind share into it. And it takes it takes the time and mind share, by the way, to have that toilet idea <laughs> which is you're sitting there and it's not that that just came, it happened to come to you at that moment, but it's because your brain had been going, yeah, nothing's really resonating. What could else could work? Totally. Um, and that, that's another interesting entrepreneurial thing. Like as I've been doing multiple ventures, you know, I've realized like I've started managing my Slack channels and my email because I realized the, the, the problem I'm solving in my brain when, when it either gets frayed across too many things or it's like the wrong thing, like I'm not putting enough. That's actually when it when uh, when I don't make a lot of progress is when my brain stops swishing around the thing in my mind. Totally. And by the way, one thing I'll I'll say is, I, it actually feels quite similar for content and just like building a business. Of you know, in the world of content, you think of it as content market fit. In the world of business, you think of it as product market fit. But there's always this question in your head what before content has popped off or before a product has really hit its stride where like the world is just asking for more of it of like how do i know it's worth investing more time or money in it versus how do i know whether it's time to like shut it down pivot it etc and so you know even just take an uh the plunge as the example right now right it is this constant emotional roller coaster because every time i go out and I play this game, I watch people having a shit ton of fun, I have a ton of fun. But if I was to compare this to what our goals are for the game right now, like, you know, our goal is to raise $300,000 on Kickstarter, which means we need 4,000 people who have put down a dollar reservation. By all measures relative to that, and of course your coach would be like, well, that's an arbitrary measure. Um, but like, by all accounts of that measure, like we're shitting the bed right now. We we should on average be having a couple hundred dollar reservations every week and we're not even close to that right now. And so, you know, at times I'm like on a high because I see people have the experience with the product and I'm like, wow, they really love it. Other times right. I'm like, are we way in over our head? Like I, I posted on um, Twitter last night. I was like, our website and our funnel for the plunge yeah, I saw that. is dog shit right now. I would like for it to not be dog shit please tear this apart productively. And first of all, it shows like the the value of having audience and, and mm -hmm. Twitter in general because it truly like made me realize how bad our website is right now and actually made me astonished that anyone has bought our game. But um, yeah, I feel like that is always the back and forth because That's there's the not a- the most fun about conversion optimization, by the way. When you see things that aren't working, we do it obviously all the time for Unbloat. And, you know, Carolyn, the CEO, she'll get, she'll be like, you, she'll be frustrated. And I'm like, wait, but the one thing to remember is this means it can only get better for like, people are still buying the product. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's 100%. my, it's my, my positive spin on it. But that, but that um, really but yeah, is it's, always it, the hard some thing. Some of it, dude, is, is, I mean, the coach thing, by the way, just so you, you know, as I hear you talk, even I, I feel your frustration. Part of the coaching stuff I've learned is, is like, again, we make up arbitrary numbers for some desired future place we want to be. And then when we're not there yet, we get mad about it. And actually the, the anger or the frustration holds us back from actually taking full accountability for it. And when we don't take full account, we're like, oh, it's my site. It's this. As opposed to going like one of the cool exercises I do with him often is how am I creating this? Like how, what are all the things I have done to get us to a 1.5% conversion rate? And then when you do it, 
it's really hard to stay mad because you're like, oh yeah, I've done all those things. Okay, so if I want that number to get to 3%, here's all the things I'll do differently. And yeah, I'm just not where I want to be yet. And versus a, you said should multiple times, you probably didn't realize that. We should be at this, we should be at that. It's like, yeah. well, no, you, you are where you are and you want to be there and, and you're not there yet by definition. And you've collapsed some future thing you made up into today and you've created like, stress for yourself right and i do it i by the way i do it all the time but like it's when you start to learn that you're like man i really it, the number is what it is you know to some degree and and, yeah. and the only way it's going to change is by you guys digging in and, and solving for it and figuring it out i think that makes um, sense well, how do you but what one quick, quick quick question i have a thought on this too is how have you how do you structure if you know for entrepreneurs listening how do you structure your periods of activity versus periods of reflection, you know, and response. Because because one thing I, I would recommend people not to do listening, and I, I'm sure you made this mistake, I've made it too, is you can't be like doing and evaluating every minute or every hour, every day even, right? You, you can't yep. say, wake up in, on Monday and say, let's do this. And then by the end of the day, go, oh no, let's do something different tomorrow. Most of the time that doesn't work. I mean, there's totally. certain examples where it might, but generally that you need some period of time of activity and then some period of time to kind of, zoom up for a second and go, did that, did that work? Or should we make a change? Yeah. I mean, the, it's like, I, I think that there, the answer is there's no right answer, but there's the, probably like the wrong answer is not having any mechanism that mm. allows you to, to step back and reflect. And so for me, I mean, we do something very simple with the plunge where it's just my partner and I, just have a weekly meeting. We have a weekly one-on-one -on -one right now, uh, Thursdays at four o'clock. And we answer the same exact questions every time. It's what worked this week, what did not work this week, and what are our priorities next week? And at the very top mm -hmm. of this doc, it has what are our goals, which is VIP reservations is is the, the goal that matters right now. It, and it's like a template we have on Google Docs. Like I'm even happy to attach it to the show notes just to have that template for weekly meetings. But for me, it is it is just a force function where I have to go through now and set aside time for 30 minutes or an hour to say, what worked this week? What didn't work this week? And um, what am I going to spend time on next week? So just to give you an example, like what when I, we did this last week, I wrote like what worked is that we are now fully running our ambassador program, which by the way, we can talk about that more because I think ambassador programs are not used nearly enough. Ambassador programs have to be kind of like this like cheap, very salesy thing like Red Bull does when they have people with backpacks right. on college campuses and it doesn't have to be like that at all. Um, you know, I wrote what worked is we ran our A-B test on our website. We now know which one performs better. And then I wrote what didn't work, and I actually ended up doing an episode about this for um, TCO is I didn't delegate enough, which slowed us down as a team, both as a function of overestimating the amount I could complete across organic and paid marketing, but also overestimating how much I could get done while traveling. And so, yeah, that hour to fill out this doc is my reflection time each week. Totally. And I think that that format, I you know, any any leader or or founder across every department, if you walked in and, and that was the beginning of your meeting, you would see an amazing amount of clarity, perspective. One of the things we've overlaid on top of that, and I, I'll, I'll you know this format is like facts versus stories. Yep. And so we you know we try to get people really tight on. I don't want to hear spin in that meeting. I don't want to hear like because most people present and go. Well, we missed the number because I was traveling. You know, no, 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 no. Yeah. We just kind of like, like I don't care. Just, no, no, it's not that I don't care. I they they have separate value from each other. Like stories are valuable also, but facts. But but they when you conflate them, they be the the, the mix of them. Yep. So it's like facts is just tell me what happened. We got this many reservations. This is how many emails we shipped. This is how many new creative got launched. And it's like it's supposed to be completely emotionless. No, and you know, and and we thought this would happen, and this is what actually happened. Okay, great, that's awesome. Now, like, what we learn or what what stories came from that? Well, I, I think I I've learned I travel too much. Or when, you know, when I'm traveling, I can only have half my capacity yep. or whatever. I think the other cool thing that you mentioned that's just worth calling out is like there's, there's again, the facts of what happened, maybe like the the reasons or the the stories or this, you know, and then there's also like learning about work and capacity. And I think I'm glad you mentioned that because I think oftentimes a lot of leaders don't make space for that part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And they don't say like when you miss a goal or you miss, you don't get something done. There's this, this one framework I love. It's just like, what did we do? And 
did we do it? That's like the first question. Like we said we would do these five things. Did we do them? Yes or no? Okay, we only did four of them. And then like of the uh, of the four, did they work? Only, uh, only two of them worked. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, how come we said five, but we only did four? Well, I, I realized that when I'm traveling, I'm, I'm too, you know, this is not, oh, okay, great. Next time you're traveling, let's not sign up for <laughs> so many totally. things. I think it's, you know, with a weekly thing, you can actually get into a very great rhythm. My answer to the question, by the way, is is like, I, I like the weekly meeting. I think I think every problem can get solved with a weekly meeting. I was talking to a, a friend of mine who works at Salesforce, which I don't know if I've told you this. This is really cool. I'll and I was like, up. you know, th- my hold code dreams. And I'm like, how do, you know, how do you do that? And he he was a pretty like he was one of, I think, 30 GMs at Salesforce. And so at that time, at least Salesforce was organized into five big divisions and then had like six divisions under each five. So there's 30 mm-hmm. sort of like PL owner GMs. He was one of them. And I was like, how does Mark Benioff run that business? Like, I don't get it. How does somebody run a business of that scale? And he goes, dude, it's super simple. He goes, everybody submits a plan. And typically that plan has to grow a minimum of 20% because that's just like Mark Benioff's thing. We grow 20% every year. And if you're hitting the plan, you meet with him once a quarter. And if you're missing the plan, you meet with him once a week. <laughs> wow. And I was like, does he yell? I love does how simple scream? that is. He's like, I was like, does he scream? Is he like <laughs> mad at you? He's like, no, 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 not at all. He's like, he's just with you. And he's like, well, how's the pipeline going? What, what, you know, he basically probably asked those questions. What did we, what worked? What didn't work? And what's our priorities for next week? And, you know, probably within a month, he either fires the person, I'd guess, because he doesn't think that they're picking the right priorities or doing, getting the stuff done, they say, or the business starts to perform because he's helped that person kind of learn and grow in, in a unique way. And so it's just funny to me because, but anyway, so, so uh, wait, I think the weekly I, meeting I have a question is, on that for a second. Do you think, so Salesforce is a, a $190 billion company, has around 80,000 employees. How much harder do you think it is or how much more skill do you think it requires for Mark Benioff to run that company than even say when you were running Ampush? It's kind of an unfair question because I think if you got rid of Mark Benioff and you put me in his place, I'd be maybe you know, if he's a 10 out of 10, I'd be a seven out of 10 or eight. Out. Like I'd be pretty good at it, but he built the thing. Right. And yep. like, and the culture that comes along with it, the like, of course it, that stuff is all leverage for him to be able to do it that way. And those are things I was on it. Like I, I struggled to scale culture as an example. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, but I'm saying like there's... the actual job of, uh, I agree with culture and like the institutional knowledge, but the actual skill set of running a multi 10,000 person company at, with that big of a P&L, how much harder is it actually running than say a $100 million business or a $10 million business? I uh, Someone told me when once Ampush, I think hit 100 and I had an executive team of, you know, five to seven. And then I had a leather layer of leaders that were like 10 below them. They were kind of like, you know, this is the same size as Amazon in terms of your actual direct reports and the actual like people you can interact with on a regular basis. Yeah. So, Everything is just sized up. Everything sized up, but but I do think there's culture. There's a build, like there's teaching people to get in. There's holding people account. Like I, I do think there's a lot. To, like I, I do not want to trivialize. I think being systematic about how you scale things between those things. Like I think there's a lot, and and I have a ton of sort of awe at that level of scale and yep. and fears that I could never scale something that. Like I feel pretty confident I could scale a business to twenty five million dollars. You know I've done it multiple times. I don't know if I could scale into 250 or to 2.5 billion. Like, uh, you know, you look at that and you go, wow, that's, it takes, there are other things that are involved in that. 100%. But I think the week, the funny thing is, again, he uses the weekly meeting. So my answer generally is like, I like two week sprints um, to kind of go, hey, let's agree on a bunch of activities. Let's go do them. Then let's see, let's go look back at what happened and learn. And then what is an example of that level, within one of your companies? Like what's a two week sprint you've done? Um, yeah. So like when we would try to, you know, we try to do stuff for unbloat, which is most similar to plunge, right. We'll do these things. And I think we're doing weekly now as well, but at one point we were doing two weeks and it would be like, okay, on Friday, the week before agree on like, what are the big things we're going to do? Okay. We're going to ship 10 new creative. We have three landing page test ideas. There's these customer cert, you know, these things need to get done. And, and we have very specific, like exactly like you, we want to drive conversion rate up. Yep. This like a win this week would look like this, or then this sprint would look like this. And then, and then like 
the stuff happens it, and that's just not worth reevaluating it on Wednesday. If you're, if you're jumping in and go, well, let's not do that instead. Like, of course, there's tons of thinking in the work getting done. Well, I like this headline instead of this headline. I, I think, but, but you can't go, we want to do Facebook on, on Monday and then by Thursday want to do, you know, but I think a lot, I think that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs. So, and, and, and then we'll, that all that work will happen. And then by Thursday, we'll start to ask that question. What did we say we do? Did we do it? Did it get done? Um, did it work? And and to how do we know did it work? And then there and then again, you're some of the stuff you're cutting every week. You're at that day, and some of the stuff you're doubling down on. And it, it's not that pretty, obviously, but but that's sort of the idea behind it. And then I think ninety day cycles are valuable for Kahani. They've been particularly valuable to kind of go like, where do we need to be in ninety days? And like you can get a lot done in ninety days. Uh, and and that'll be a big thing we use, and we get to the end of the quarter, and it really, gives, especially when you're thinking about product market fit, it really gives you perspective on. You know, we, you know, for Kahani, for example, we took 70, I think 75 meetings in Q1 sales meetings. Wow. It's like, it's hard not to know if your product is selling. <laughs> like you, You're not, you're not. If, and the thing is, even just taking the time to resume out, you can convince yourself of anything. Exactly. Like, we have five customers who signed into trials and a couple who signed into annuals, which is really exciting. And you go, oh, no, no, but look, look at that really. But you zoom out for a second. You go, we took 75 meetings. You know, I know, I know what growth assistance conversion is. I know, oh, man, it's it's not there. You know, and and so it's, and then I think the most important thing is then make a change, whether it's in those two week periods or that ninety day period. Then you have to say, wait a second, guys, we got to do something different here. Should we build this part of the product? Should we adjust? You know, how we're marketing and selling it. Um, and and you have you, if for no other reason than like doing the same thing and expecting different results is again the definition of insanity. Yep. And so. You want to do something different, whatever it may be. It might, you know, might be like for Kahani, for example, the best signal we found was lots of the social content people inside of brands have loved it. It wasn't what we expected, but they go, oh, great. I'm making all this content on social and now I get to put it on the website. That's amazing. And so like me and uh, Andrew spent last week, we just redid the whole pitch deck and we just said, you know what? That's what we sell now. That's the business. Like that, it, it, it's not, we don't talk about the changing mobile website and all this big rah rah stuff we go this is the best way to get your social content on your website and all of a sudden you can see the different conversation happening and it resonates differently and so by the way that might not be the right thing too but we'll do that and then we'll do the same thing and so how do you how do you navigate that emotionally in the sense that right you like going into like even as we've talked about on the show right you, you you light up when you talk about like mobile's changing and the way that people like it feels like a big audacious vision right of like everything's going the way of social platforms why have, as has the website not evolved for that as you get signal from the market that says maybe the market isn't interested in that pitch and maybe it's actually a different part of the market that is interested in a piece of what we're doing how do you reconcile kind of on one hand maybe this is logically the best way to go with the product but on the other hand the emotional reaction you have to it going that way. Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of parts for me. I think one is uh, like I usually don't fall in love with my own ideas. Like I, I can be pretty pragmatic, and it's just like anything. When I'm in it, you know, it's like I always wondered how uh, Cardinals players will will wear the Cardinals jersey, bleed for the Cardinals, and get traded to the Mets, and all of a sudden they're you know. Totally. And it's not that different, right? Like I, I, I will be like, no, this is the thing. And then and then at some point I'll go, well, the world's saying it's not the thing. I think that's one of it. So I just don't I don't fall in love with my own ideas too deeply. Um, and I'm willing to hear and, and give, you know, you have to give it a reasonable amount of time. And I think the other thing is, though, connecting the journey, like instead of spending 10 minutes talking about how mobile is changing and then showing Kahani. I think you still spend a minute on it. I still, I, I, you know, you connect the dots and the story for yourself as well as for others, which is, hey, we believe mobile is changing. Blah blah. blah. One of the first migrations is going to be content coming on your website, and by the way, this is the best tool to do that. And I think one of the big sort of humbling moments for Kahani for me has definitely been, I am good at pitching a good vision, but nobody buys vision. Nobody eats vision. They eat problems. Like they have issues and they need someone to solve them. And so visions are great. But if they don't solve someone's problem, it doesn't matter. They're not gonna. They're not gonna buy your product. Well, and to that point, I would say you've seen called differing results in kind of the way the market has accepted or been like sucked into 
growth assistant versus Kahani? Like, I feel like you've seen Big very time. different results from the market. What have you learned in kind of the two ways the market has either accepted or not fully accepted these two products? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've learned a lot. It, it, it's funny, actually, I'll pivot this to the conversation about the new business we're starting, which I know you wanted to talk about. But I think the, the couple of things, you know, one of the things I'm learning is the, I'll, I'll say two things. I, number one thing I'm learning is I think there's a lot more to be said, at least for me, you know, there's probably some super innovative Steve Jobs, like people who can imagine something and, and will it into the world for finding demand that exists and is unserved and serving it. And, and like, and, and the way I know is like, people were asking me for growth assistant, not in those words for years, years, like uh, forever. And then it's like, okay, now it popped up and, and it jumped off and nobody has been asking me for Kahani, right? No one was like, yeah, I wish this was happening. And, and no one even says that. No one, no one voice. I say that. Cause I'm like this excited entrepreneur to say, well, why does the site look so terrible? Yeah. Nobody, none of the guys running the sites say that they don't actually look for that. Right. And, and I think that's a really important piece. And then the second thing, which I think again, relates to this new venture, which I can share what it is. It's pretty, it's, a, it's very different is again, back to this founder market, founder uh, product fit or founder business fit, yeah. right? Which I think Adrian, you know, she, she could operationalize. It's funny because a lot of what we're, we do, that business is actually, as much as I was, I've been able to drive demand for it, it's actually not a demand constrained business. It's just not, it's a supply constrained business, right? So supply being if I can the find actual growth assistance that people, you place into yeah, companies. It, it, if you can find great talent and great people, guess what? You'll have a line out the door and it's, and, and you know, it's never really a problem. And a lot of what we're doing to figure out supply and, and, and by supply, I don't just mean recruiting and, and we get plenty of resumes. It's screening for the right people. It's matching them to the right situation. And when Adrian was literally doing the whole business by herself for the first year, her brain was just doing that naturally. Totally. She would upsell someone, not because she would upsell them the way I might think about upselling, but because she'd go, I met this person. They're perfect for you. And the company would go, you're right. They're perfect for me. How did you know, Adrian? And so a lot of what her and I do is like, I'm like, how do we get your brain out of your brain? And like there, an org chart is being designed around her brain and how her brain would process the process of vetting and matching people. Um, and so it's that, also like, interesting for me to think about how that process could be applicable to not just growth assistant, but kind of like any offshore talent business where you need to place talent with a company. This episode of The Crazy Ones is brought to you by ADP. Hiring and onboarding is expensive, but turnover takes the cake when it comes to cost. Luckily, there's a key to controlling your biggest business cost. ADP Total Source, the largest professional employer organization or PEO. See how your costs, including turnover, compare to other companies with a free benchmark report from ADP. As a client, put insights into action with your own dedicated HR pro to advise on compensation strategies, pay transparency, and pay equity to help attract and retain employees. The result? PEOs can lower employee turnover by 12 to 14%. Take the free quiz at adp.com slash the crazy ones to see if a PEO is right for you and get a free benchmark report. That's adp.com slash the crazy ones. Ah, spring, the perfect time to refresh your wardrobe, your apartment, and that's right, your email marketing. Don't have time to analyze all those data points about performance or spend months researching new content strategies. MailChimp helps take the guesswork out of your marketing strategy. Unlike other platforms that just report on how your emails are performing, MailChimp analyzes real data from billions of emails that they send to provide personalized, industry-specific guidance. These data-backed recommendations can help improve your email content, subject lines, audience targeting, and so much more. Stop guessing about your audience and start targeting future customers with MailChimp's informative, personalized, and data back recommendations. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash guesswork. That's MailChimp.com slash guesswork. MailChimp sponsored this segment of the podcast. MailChimp is not affiliated with any other products, brands, or companies featured or mentioned on the podcast. And this new business, I'll tell you about it, uh, so you're really you burying the lead. You've, you've been dragging it out for weeks. Finally, we get the reveal. 
Well, it's been changing, and, and I'll, t- I'll tell you how and why it changed. So, um, I, you know, I'm starting it with a, a local uh, CEO in town. Um, she's she's kind of selling. She sold off uh, the company she used to work at, and I've known her for many years. Uh, you know, we her and I took a walk maybe, I don't know, a month ago, and I was like, here's all my ideas. I have all these ideas. And I was like, which one should we work? And she's like, oh, I really like this one. And the original idea was uh, kind of like a growth marketing school. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost like a Lambda school for growth marketing. And that's kind of where we started it. And we started going down the path and it became very clear that she she was like, you know, I think this is a great business. I don't sure I'm the right person to be building it. I, my, I've, I've managed growth marketers. I know a fair bit to be dangerous, but I'm not, I don't bleed the content here. Yep. And I don't bleed teaching people. And we go, oh, that's really interesting, right? And and then the second thing was, you know, p- people are asking for it in the sense that we talked to a bunch of customers, we did some validation, and everyone said, hey, if you wanted to start a recruiting agency and then train the people for me, I'd be up for that. I'd be up for retraining. We got a lot of feedback. That, again, I think there's an opportunity there, uh, and we'll it'll, it's on the Gateway X list for sure uh, of a business, but it wasn't right for her, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it, the, people are asking for it. It has as much demand, but there's another idea that I was like, had in my back pocket that I get pinged about once a month. And what that is, is the, are you familiar with the private equity due diligence space? Uh, like, are you talking about like what, uh, people do with, uh, GLG? No, there's, there's a level up from that. Like Bain and McKinsey each have like nine figure businesses. You know, Deloitte has, you know, I- I- example was like probably for your deal or my deal, like Deloitte got paid probably a couple hundred thousand dollars to audit the financials of Ampush and make I sure they it. were legit before the deal got done, right? Yep. And then McKinsey and Bain have these more strategic versions that I actually worked on them for nine months when I was there. Like KKR was buying some big telco company. They brought brought McKinsey in. I had to build a model that looked at price, price ARP min, average revenue per minute across every carrier and compared how competitive they were based on a variety of plan factors and prepaid and postpaid and blah, blah, blah. And then we had to go to the private equity firm and say, hey, look, we've compared pricing. They're they're basically the second most expensive in the market. This is how much margins you could change by if you wanted to reduce their pricing by. And some, Got some it. You know, so, private equity so it's guys. So it's basically outsourced due diligence by people who have institutional knowledge around that business. Uh, not the institutional part. They just have know-how around the category of the subject matter. Yep. So anyway, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the that's industry. I mean. yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty big industry. We're starting that for growth marketing because every week, every month without fail, maybe more, I get a call or an email from a friend. A lot of my friends from college who work in private equity and they go, Hey Jesse, I just got a business under LOI. It's a, it's a half a billion dollar deal. You know, here's the stats. By the way, they spend $50 million on digital marketing. I have no idea. Is that a risk? Is that an opportunity? I don't know. Can you, Jesse, can you look at it? I'm like, I got 20 minutes, man. Like <laughs> if you want to show it to me, I'll look at it. But I've literally, and, I, and then at some point I started like, what would you pay for this? They're like, I don't know, $150,000. And I'm like, okay. Like, and so Casey, and Casey's done a ton of deals. She herself has done a bunch of M&A. Um, and so there's just this exciting moment now where we're, we're building up this business. Uh, Super and so it kind of follows those two paradigms though. And so just out of curiosity, because you're at such an interesting point with it now, and it's actually at like a kind of similar point to where I am with this content agency. What are the most, the the biggest priorities you have to push this forward now? Like, what are you focused on? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's like, we're lining up, you know, the right offering. We're creating Mm -hmm. the right offering, which is what are we doing actually, (laughs) Right. And, and okay, what, what are we selling? We're going to, we're going to evaluate your this. We're going to evaluate your team and in, in this. We're going to evaluate your talent. We're going to evaluate your media. We're going to evaluate your marketing and positioning. We're going to evaluate. There was that first podcast I ever did with, with Patrick O'Shaughnessy. I don't know if you've ever listened to it. It's about 90 minutes. There's I don't a think ton so. of content in there. It's intended for a private equity or finance audience. And so she's listened to it and basically taken a lot of the concepts and turned them into like a, here's how we offer this product. But we'll do, there's like smaller projects and bigger projects. And there's pre like pre close and post close essentially, so we're kind of making the offering menu right, and then making sure we understand at least estimate what kind of costing will be involved to kind of deliver things at a seventy percent gross margin, let's say, so that we can get the work done and and obviously turn you know turn a profit on it when we when we drive it forward. And so and then and then dude, I think that's going to be you know maybe the next month, and then I'd say I already have a couple calls lined up, but by May. Like we'll go out and we'll pitch it 
And then it's just a matter of time before five people go, yeah, yeah, we need that. We need that. Let's do it. And that's when you actually learn the business, right? By the way. <laughs> totally. Once you have customers, that's when you actually learn the business. Um, and, and you actually give them and then they turn around and they go, this is the best thing I've ever seen. Or they're like, guys, we paid you $50,000 for this. Like, <laughs> and so hopefully that won't happen. But um, there, there's two but, things here that you didn't explicitly say, but I think are really interesting. The first is, again, this business similarly, don't know whether this business will work out, but I would say this business has a similar profile to growth assistant, where it is very simply the business is starting from you getting text messages or emails from people who are interested in a thing. So it's it's not just an idea you have or even a problem you have, but it's like a problem that has been served to you in the form of question by a number of people where like that's where how it worked with growth assistant it's not necessarily how it worked with kahani the second thing is like you may you have this list of businesses that you're interested in building out with um gateway x and you didn't say this but like you made a very tactical decision of you were interested in the lambda school for growth marketers so a school to teach people to train them up in growth marketing you had a, a CEO or an operator who you wanted to work with. And basically you made the very intentional choice of I, I'm betting on the CEO, the operator. And like the idea, maybe there'll be a time where I launch that, but that's less important than finding the right business with this person. There's all kinds of other nuance here, right? Like creating trust and candor because, because, you know, she doesn't know me that well. We've been in, but there was a moment where I kind of said, you know, how are you feeling about like, is this, is this, and she, you know, she was able to go, you know what, Jesse, if I'm being honest, this doesn't feel exactly right for me. Yeah. And what if she hadn't said that? Oh, And totally. most of the time people don't say that. Right. And, and then we would have been running this business, you know, and, and like, that's even I've done versions of that where I'm not being, you know, like either they don't know. And, and so I think that was super important. And I think that's for me. I don't know, man. I, I the people and the business are people and business are the things I care and are passionate about. The specific idea, the specific customer. Sure, you build. You know, you want to build a great business for sure, always. But you know, those are just they're always secondary to me. And I, I think I used to resist that kind of like you know, yeah, people below the line and frustrated about it. And now I'm like, you know what? How do I embrace it? Because that's totally. Who I am. What well, one last question I have for you, and then we'll uh, we'll take a question from a Crazy Ones listener <clears throat> before we uh, we call it a day. You have like a number of things going on right now, right? Like you're you are the operating CEO of Kahani. You are you have. Uh, growth assistant, which you're providing support as the chairman. You're working on this new business. You have um, Unbloat. On a scale of zero to 10, zero being all of your time is free, 10 being you've been, you're the most spread thin you've ever been. How pulled in different directions do you feel right now? And how do you recalibrate yourself if and when you feel pulled in too many directions? I think for the average person, I'm like a 12. I think for me, I'm like a six. Cause mostly because, and that's not saying anything positive about me. That's saying I've stretched myself more thin in the past. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And like in the early days of AMP, I mean, I've done much crazier things, you know. Um, You've just pushed the limits. I've pushed the limits much further than I have now, mostly because now I have kids and, and I have a, a more set schedule. Uh, I, I think where it shows up now where it didn't in the past, I would, I would try to be effective and I would be decently effective at a lot of things. Now it's like, Oh, certain things just aren't effective. Like mm -hmm. they're not, they're not moving forward. We're not learning fast enough. We're not going fast enough. And you know, it's funny. I, I just went through this exercise where I kind of looked at my time. I looked at my calendar and I said, man, I don't feel like I'm being as effective as I can be. Yes. It's cause I'm spread too thin. First, I, I started consolidating meetings and days. So, for example, like the only time I talk to Adrian and uh, and Carolyn is Fridays. Uh, and I did that, but even that wasn't working. And that's when I went to the Slack thing. And I was like, you know what? It's because like I'm sitting in Slack and I see the Facebook results and I'm like, oh, hey, great day today. Or I'm like, yeah, kind of a rough day. Why don't we try it? And then I, yeah. I, I had to have a conversation with with both of them saying, look. I think we're now at the place where it'll actually serve us better for you and to have a more formal conversation, to have more specific touch points. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it's good actually for me to be in these channels. Like, I think it's important that I'm not actually, cause when I'm in them, then it feels like, Oh, Jesse's alongside. He knows what's going on. And even we had, we had our first version of those meetings last week. And Carolyn was like, Jesse, this was so awesome because it forced me to actually zoom myself up 
to be able to talk to you about what I've done for the last week versus knowing that you've seen all of it in Slack over the last week. And so you're sort of up to speed. And she goes, that was really helpful. That really gave me a lot of value. Uh, And by the way, the way I framed the conversations with me, which is just an interesting thing is, you are not reporting to me. I am your servant. You are co- like, but in order to make me a great servant, I got to like know what happened in your business. I got to know the numbers. I have to, I have to like see what you, you know, I have to be, you have to be candid and transparent with me. I can't serve you if I don't know what's going on. But, but you're like, cause a lot of times people show up to that meeting and they go, what do you want to know, Jesse? And I go, I, I don't, you know, I want, what do you, what can you use help with? Where's the area? That's like probably a thing I picked up from Rick, which was just like I we would you know throw up in front of him for thirty minutes with our deck. And he's like, what do you guys want from me? Yeah, you know, like uh, not I don't care about any of this. How, how can I help you? Yeah, what are yeah, your yeah. big problems you need help you need solving? Uh, so I think creating that dynamic has been helpful. But yeah, I think it's just I probably do it on a ninety day cycle, uh, <clears throat> sometimes more aggressively. I also it takes me probably a week or two. And I think Sean Puri talks about this too. And, and now that he said it, I very much notice it. You probably notice it too. Is like, I notice these confusionary states I go through. I just, oh, a hundred percent. Something is, something is weird. Something is off. And then I, and then I'm like, okay, clarity will come. And then when clarity comes for me within 24, you know, within a yeah. few days, I'm, I've changed everything. I really think I've talked about this. Uh, I've just said it differently, but I've always talked about this in kind of even my move out of the CEO role for Morning Brewing, kind of like the most extreme case, but it happens all the time where it's I really believe your body knows what you want before your brain knows what you want, and there's a delay period. And the delay is th- – what happens during the delay is your feeling of confusion because you feel a certain way, but you don't know why you feel that way. And so to me, it's like how do you become most aware of why you feel what you feel so you can close the gap of what that delay period is between your body and your head? Totally, totally. And it's also like, I, I think the the old Jesse would feel that feeling and then fill it with activity. He would get yep. so scared and he'd go, yep. oh, no, 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 no. Let me just go call some more clients <laughs> or let me go. And the new Jesse, most of the time, not always, will go, oh, I feel funky. And then and then like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be with this. Yep. I'm not going to try to solve what I am feeling right now, which is a really, has been very big personal growth for me. I uh, love that. Let's do the AMA. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. We are going to finish up with a question from... Uh, Ashlyn, by the way, we've been getting tons of emails from listeners. Just want to call out a few quickly. Trevor Russo, Kristen Kovner, Ali Nickel, Whitney Larson, James Van Heerden, Marcus Hartle, Andrew Williams, the list goes on. So if you have any questions for us or if there are any episode topics you want us to hit, email the crazy ones at morningbrew.com. Now uh, let's take the question from Ashlyn. So Ashlyn Greer said, if you only had $5,000 total to spend on any paid marketing today, where would you put it? Bootstrap business two years in and averaging five to six thousand dollars of monthly revenue. Organic TikTok and word of mouth has gotten us to where we are, but we have been stagnant at that growth rate for the last twelve months. Tested paid influencers on TikTok for Jan and Feb, and it hasn't converted. So Jesse, you're you're the master of paid marketing. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna push this to you. Five to six. $5,000 total spend on any paid marketing. What are you doing if you're Ashlyn or what questions are you asking her to get to that answer? Yeah, I think the first question is what business are you in? You know, yep. t- typically if you're in a if you're in a business that has demand built in, meaning people come and search for it, like insurance is very common in this way or uh travel, search is a way better uh way better place to start. You know, especially if you have competitors by their brand search, by their non-brand search. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a very low priced product, I would, I would maybe think about like email or organic TikTok is good, but like do something different. Cause clearly whatever you're doing hasn't worked or hasn't gotten to you to the next level, you know, and, and if it's a slightly higher ARPU or, or not a higher, you know, AOV average order value type product, I would think about, t- you know, lighting up Facebook 50 bucks a day and and just for a little more context, some. I just looked up. This could or couldn't be Ash uh, Ashlyn, but I looked up Ashlyn Greer on LinkedIn. It looks like the business is personal styling. So she has clients that pay her and her stylist to do personal styling for their wardrobes and for what they wear. So that's the context mm. on the business. Okay. Yeah. So that's not a, that might have some search demand though, right? Like I would definitely look at that. And if it does, I guarantee you she's one of the few people doing that. Yep like personal styling. So I would, that could be a great way to start. If you only had $5,000 is just buy some keywords. Um, 
I think like another interesting one for her, depending on if she's assuming she's good at what she does, like she can incent referrals much more aggressively. That'd be an easy way to start uh, and kind of get it to a certain viral point. I mean, the the thing about Facebook or even Google, Google's probably easier, but Facebook they and TikTok, I mean, there's overhead in learning how to use their platforms. That's real. Totally. And so I would never start by spending more than 50 bucks a day. And then like, yeah, I tell everyone, spend 50 bucks a day. Okay, you spend 300. Did you get any leads? Like you got nothing. Okay, well, then then make some different ads or try a different pathway. And like, don't like there's this, just a, we're all very impatient. We're like, no, no, we have to do we have to spend more. And it's like, make sure you're getting, you know, I don't know, 10 leads. I don't know. I don't know how our business works exactly. But, te- you know, 10 leads a day off 50 bucks before you start to spend more on that channel, which, by the way, if she's getting 10 leads a day, it's five dollars a lead. Let's say even five to ten dollars a lead. She's going to be super busy all of a sudden. She's going to totally. have plenty of work to do. And so she probably doesn't need to spend more than 50 to get where she needs to get. If she's spending 500 to get five or 10 leads, that's not going to be a workable business model. hundred percent. Right? The, the, the curve ball that I would be interested in how this would perform for her is Pinterest. Like what would Pinterest ads look like given people's appetite for looking for fashion picks on Pinterest? But I don't know how effective their ad platform is, but that's what came to mind first. Um, okay. That is the show today. Another fun one where we just – turn on the mic, talk about what's going on in our lives. And it's kind of refreshing because we get to basically have our catch-ups like we would in real life. And we just have to happen to be rolling on the mic and the camera. Jesse, anything else before uh, we break for the day? Nope. Have a great week. Cool. Take it easy, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of The Crazy Ones. If you're an entrepreneur or a builder and want more great startup content, make sure to subscribe on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts.